you so much for joining us, Linda. We're really excited to have you here today. We appreciate it. Can you let us know, where do we stand as a state right now in terms of this huge monumental shift to distance learning? How are we doing as a state? Well, in some respects, we're doing well. Uh, like virtually every district is providing distance learning in some form. Uh, and that's different than some states that basically close the school doors and send everyone home and they're really not trying to reach kids and teach kids. Um, but we also have a huge digital divide in the state. And just as an example, there are about half of the districts in the state report that uh, virtually 100% of um, learning, dis distance learning is online and 100% of their kids have devices. Um, and some big districts, you know, went way out on a limb, Los Angeles, um, San Diego, and bought you know, lots of uh, computers and hotspots for their kids to really fill the digital divide that existed. But in you know, about a quarter of the districts, you know, something uh, less than half the kids are online. And so we have this big digital divide in terms of what's possible. We're working very rapidly to try to fill that divide. Uh, the governor, the first partner, myself, um, state superintendent have been trying to raise money from corporations and philanthropists to buy hotspots and computers. Um, and we are probably, uh, we've closed the divide by about half, but we still have a long way to go. And so distance learning looks different in different parts of the state. Do you have an estimate of how many students still don't have access to, to Chromebooks and to internet in the state? Uh, when we ask districts to let us know what their needs are, uh, we get a number somewhere around 250,000 kids need um, hotspots and or devices to be able to be you know, connected and online. Now we also have uh, school buses that have been wired up with um, Wi-Fi providing hotspots to some neighborhoods and some apartment buildings and so on. So not everybody has it in the home. Uh, so there are some creative solutions like that, but we, we do have a very substantial uh, number of both rural and urban households that are uh, still in need. And what do you think is proven to be the biggest challenge to educators and teachers as they're, as they're making this shift? Well, I think the challenges are different in different places. It's not like one thing, right? As a, uh, in some districts, you know, near me, I'm in the Silicon Valley area where everybody was wired up anyway. They started distance learning online with Zoom classrooms and Google Hangout, you know, three weeks ago. And, you know, most of the kids are used to it. They're online, they're, you know, they're chugging ahead. Uh, those teachers do have the challenge of learning to teach effectively online. Um, they uh, need to, figure out in every district how to be socially and emotionally connected to kids, to do the personalization, to reach out to students who have um, disabilities and need modifications and accommodations. Um, but in some other districts where, you know, the needs are much greater, um, you've got the need to really find kids. You know, there are lots and lots of kids who are homeless. Um, I know in San Diego, they just wired up some homeless shelters so that kids there could, you know, be engaged. But then, you know, the teachers and the kids are trying to figure out, well, where do I go to be able to not have 15 people around me also trying to be online and talking? And how do I um, support kids who are experiencing trauma? Uh, and, you know, what is the role of the social worker, the counselor, who's also trying to reach out uh, along with the teacher. I would say that almost all the educators I talk to are keenly aware that this is not just about academic learning. It is about social and emotional supports, uh, allowing kids to process what's going on with them, uh, learning how to sort of talk about feelings and create a sense of community, and also dealing with the many, many families who are experiencing trauma. So given all of those factors that are happening right now, what level of learning should we realistically be expecting our students to achieve at this moment in time? You know, it's an interesting question because what can be learned now may be different than what we would learn in a classroom, you know, around the standards-based curriculum, but kids are always learning. And they're learning 
some really powerful life lessons now. They can be learning a lot about how to problem solve in uh, the variety of contexts that they're in. Uh, some of them are making you know, progress on the learning the standard curriculum. Uh, parents are educators now in the home and where they're well connected. Um, kids may be learning how to apply things in real life. For example, um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing about um, families and teachers who are saying, you know, um, watch a cooking show, create your own cooking show, videotape your cooking show, and triple the recipe or multiply it by three and a half or whatever. And they're learning math skills in context um, that are different than the way you would sit down and do a problem set. Uh, but are also more likely to stick because when you apply learning, it actually uh, can be retained and uh, transferred sometimes more easily. So I think what kids are learning may often differ from the standard curriculum, but they may be learning cognitive skills, problem solving skills, observation, recording, and inquiry skills. In a lot of cases, kids are engaged in applying what they learned in school to projects that are passionate for them. And this is a really important thing about distance learning, is you're gonna get kids more engaged and they're going to use their minds and make progress cognitively if they're really interested and it applies to them. So I think that we are gonna see a lot of the cognitive skill development that you get from project-based learning where people are doing that. Um, and if that's engaging them in reading, their reading skills are going to continue to advance. If it's engaging them in the use of quantitative reasoning and mathematics, their capacity to understand it is going to continue to advance. And then in the fall, we'll need to take stock and see what, you know, needs to happen to support ongoing progress. Uh, but we shouldn't think that learning has stopped. And in some cases, you know, learning is uh, accelerating. Do you think that there's going to be some long-term educational consequences to this, specifically thinking of maybe those students who are not connected right now um, or don't have devices and maybe are, are, are falling behind their peers? Yeah, I do think that, you know, we should expect, I mean, we have huge inequities in our system, um, inequities that we have unfortunately not paid enough attention to uh, over a period of time. And we were beginning to make progress uh, with the LCFF formula in closing some of those gaps. Uh, but this has really made the inequities very, very stark. Uh, and those kids who uh, have not been able to be connected are getting a very different kind of experience. Those who are in situations that don't have the extra personnel who reach out, uh, you know, as special education teachers or paraprofessionals or social workers or counselors um, with the additional supports are getting a different experience than those who are in the more um, affluent districts with stronger staffing. So we will see ways in which the divide grows. We're going to have to worry about uh, being sure that we um, evaluate what kids need and you know, take care of um, closing gaps that may have uh, gotten larger. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing. It's not um, fully predictable. I've been talking to a lot of people who work with students with special education needs of various kinds. And, uh, you know, I'm hearing some parents and teachers say, uh, we've had to modify, we've need, needed to accommodate, we've needed to figure out a different way to do things. Um, in some cases, there are real challenges and struggles that people are working out. And in some other cases, I hear people saying, yeah, this student is doing even better than they were doing in school. Uh, because they're focused on the work, they're getting one-on-one -on -one attention, they're not having to worry about bullying, and they're actually getting through the curriculum more quickly than they would have otherwise. So it's going to be just a very, very diverse, variable reality when, when we get back to school. So when we do come back to school in the fall, what is that going to look like? Well, it's not going to look like what we're used to. Uh, it's highly likely that schools will start at different times in different parts of the state because county uh, health offices will let us know in different locations when we've met the six criteria that the governor laid out for being able to put people in spaces together. But we're likely also to still need to be uh, socially distant, uh, six feet apart. So that may mean that 
To do that, we have to use different parts of the school building to spread kids out. We may need to use the Boys and Girls Club and the community center as places of learning as well. We may need to have some kids who are in school on Mondays and Wednesdays and doing distance learning on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and other kids in school on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and using time and space differently, I think there's the possibility that school will start up and then it'll have to be closed down again in a, in a physical way um, if we have a resurgence of the virus in the fall. So flexibility is gonna be hugely important. Strong personal relationships are gonna be hugely important. Uh, and we've got to close this digital divide because it's not just about the next few weeks of school. It's about the way that we're gonna be doing school uh, long into the future with blended strategies and uses of technology that um, you know, were not present before. In addition to that physical distancing, I know the state budget is gonna change um, you know, with the economic circumstances that we're in. What might that mean for schools? Could they be facing cuts at the same time that that's, um, all the social distancing is going on as well? Yes, we are gonna have a much uh, tighter state budget because the uh, closing down of the economy means there's gonna be less tax revenue next year. It's gonna be worse next year than it is this year. Uh, and uh, we've gotta get uh, health expenditures handled and a variety of other things. Uh, so districts are appropriately worried about what the future holds financially. The federal government has now issued three uh, stimulus packages. There are two more being developed in Washington. Those are going to be very important. The money from the first uh, of the several CARES Acts that the federal government is sending will start arriving uh, next month. Uh, California will see about $1.6 billion uh, to dis primarily to districts to help them cover some of the expenses that they've experienced. There's another one being written now that we hope will have a larger uh, share for education. Uh, there is yet another bill under development that will support infrastructure, which could, might include things like uh, facilities and maintenance and so on. Uh, but it's still unknown whether the economy will recover fast enough and the federal recovery funds will flow uh, adequately to really you know, bridge the gap. What would you like to say to parents at this moment in time? Well, I would like to say two things. One, you need to be forgiving of yourself as a parent. <laughs> Uh, is not about every kid making, you know, a week's worth of progress for every week that they're at home doing distance learning on the standard curriculum. Uh, you need to think about how to create and grab and seize teachable moments out of the, you know, stress and, you know, uncertainty and unpredictability that's there. There are going to be issues and problems in families, you know, how do we share space, how do we manage our time together? You need to get these things done, I need to get those things done. You know, those can become actual challenges that you take up as little research projects. Hey, let's, you can either get frustrated and say, ah, this is not working, or you can say, hey, we've got a problem, let's try to solve it together. What are the, how can we share our space and time? What are some possible solutions? Let's list them out. What are the pros and what are the cons of doing it this way or that way? Let's figure out something we can try. We can then observe what happens and kind of take notes on it and come back together and see whether we need to adjust our plan. That actually is a way to teach the higher order thinking and executive function skills and problem solving skills that are some of the most important skills we learn in life. And they are absolutely as important as whether you got those 10 math problems done. Uh, at the time that you hope to sit at the kitchen table and do them. Those problems are also important, but you have many learning opportunities. So I'd say to parents, you know, use the teachable moments, use the opportunities that you can grab for bonding and, you know, creating those strong relationships. Uh, think about doing that, you know, cooking lesson with your kids and doubling or two and a half times in the recipe. Uh, think about ways that you can let them explore things they're really interested in um, and use it as an opportunity for that, you know, kind of deep dive kind of learning. 
um, and be forgiving to them and be forgiving to yourself uh, about how you live and love together in the moment. Is there anything from an education standpoint that you feel is positive that will come out of this, this virus, this crisis at the end of everything? I think there are lots, you know, in every moment of uh, challenge, there are moments of opportunity. Uh, and, you know, they say um, necessity is the mother of invention. So, for example, the digital divide that we were talking about has existed for at least two decades. And in the last month, we've just about cut it in half in California. Um, you know, we will figure out, teachers will figure out, kids will figure out, families will figure out how to use technology in a lot of different ways in the learning process. Uh, because we have to, we'll get better at it and we'll bring that to the table. We will have had these opportunities for families to take a breath, to step back from travel and running around and be together and create uh, different kinds of relationships and bonds. Um, you know, to the extent that families can engage in thinking about how to connect with others, you know, um, that will also have spillover effects. I think we're more conscious as a society of how we're inter interdependent and how what we do, you know, affects each other and how we really do need to think of everyone's well-being. I think we may be a, a kinder, caring um, community at the other end of this process as well. So there are many opportunities to seize uh, the changes that we have to go through and think about how to allow those to profit us in the long run. Kinder, more caring community. I really like that. So we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you so much, Linda Darling Hammond, for your time. We really appreciate you being with us. Great to see you. Thank you.